Thank you, Fiona. And like others, I'm really th pleased to be here in this extraordinary reinvention of the gallery that Anthony Spear and 6A have achieved. And it's remarkable not only for the building itself, of course, but for the fact that it is now a building which sits within the city rather than simply. And the realm around the building has been animated by the way in which the building has been orientated and the way in which the building uh, sits in, in between the city and the park. Um, as people have said, this is a discussion about placemaking, um, creativity, and the role of new towns. And new towns remain, I think, very, very important in this discussion because I see them as being, again, at the leading edge of thinking about how we will live uh, and hopefully thrive together in a world that's changing rapidly. And I think they sit at the leading edge in part because, as we've been seeing in the earlier presentations, there's a need to reinvent those towns or many of those towns and reinvest in many of those towns that were created in the 1940s and 50s. Um, and there's also the challenge of building a vast number of homes over the next few years in this corridor between Oxford, Cambridge, et cetera, et cetera, and of course in other places in the country and not just in the southeast. Um, as Cara has said, in a way, the modern concept of placemaking may have its roots in the social justice movement of the 1960s in America, but humans have been thinking about what makes a good city for people, or perhaps more often for its rulers, for centuries. There have been times in our recent history when we've been bold, but success can never be guaranteed. And there are lessons that need to be learned, as I think we've been seeing during the course of the morning. So I want to talk a little bit about the relationship of new towns to public art and how that may inform our current approach to art and culture within placemaking. It's self-evident that people are shaped physically and temperamentally by natural and built environments. It's reflected in our life expectancy, well-being, optimism, the food we eat, the music we produce. We're shaped by place, and how we experience that place determines how we shape ourselves. Like family relationships, it's a self-reinforcing circle. And like some family relationships, it's a self-destructive circle. So new towns emerged in a post-war world with post-war wounds. When there was a desire, and a collective will to start afresh and build towns that would better reflect the principles of social democracy, putting people first. It involved what was seen as a rejection of organic and messy urban culture, though perhaps we undervalued that, and offering art and culture in external, say external physical ways through planning, architecture, and sometimes through artistic intervention. This is not Milton Keynes, but it is relevant because um, Milton Keynes, founded in 67, and very much developed by Fred Roche and Derek Walker as architects and planners. Interestingly enough, they were born in 1929 and 1931, and I did wonder whether they had been looking at uh, Jean de Brunoff's Bar Bar books this was published in 1937. Uh, they would have been six and eight. Um, I'm not saying it's the master plan for Milton Keynes, but I think you'll recognize a few elements. Uh, and perhaps, actually, a few elements that the original planners of Milton Keynes forgot to include, like a Palais de Fate. Uh, there's also a Palais de Travail, but I mean, there's a place for music, for dance. Um, some of these were not actually originally provided in the original Milton Keynes. But there you see uh, the Millennium Boulevard, Avebury and Silbury. Um, obviously, um, Milton Keynes uh, reflected 
as we've heard in a way, the ambition of the Garden City movement, overlaid by modernist principles of Le Corbusier and probably the experience of America uh, in the 1950s. Um, there was an ambition to combine the natural world with modern life, but as we've already heard, it was a modern life based on the private car. Green squares do make up 40% of the 119 square miles that represents the whole city. And they're joined, of course, by this grid of wide roads. I suppose given what we now know about climate change, this perhaps seems a bit incongruous. But at the time, you have to remember the degree to which the car represented freedom and prosperity and was supposedly one of the joys of family life. Milton Keynes was being designed, uh, the nuclear family life, I should say. But the Milton Keynes, of course, was being designed in the late 60s. It's probably quite difficult for most people in this audience to realize that actually that was only eight years after the first motorway opened in this country. And that was always seen as an uh, extraordinary move to modernize the country, whether anyone th now thinks the M1 is the way in which Britain really would present itself from the 1950s and 60s, I don't know. Anyway, public art uh, did play, as we've heard in, in the description of, of Harlow, um, and still plays an important part in the success of um, several of the new towns, including Milton Keynes and Liz Lay's Concrete Cows from 78 are perhaps amongst the best known works of public art. They were certainly excellent marketing and they promoted, projected a friendly image about the relationship between culture and nature. Uh, I think Stephen would have something to say about that and he no doubt will. Um, it was a different fate for earlier new towns. Harlow, established, as we've heard again, in 1946, employed leading modernists to work on its suburbs and also tried to internalize the landscape. But it wasn't perhaps able, there are probably people from Harlow here who won't like me saying this, but it perhaps wasn't able to generate a lasting sense of cultural identity. And that's a theme which I think a number of individuals have touched on. How do you make whatever you create endure I mean, should it endure? But if it's good, how do you ensure that it does? I think the challenge for new towns was to create a sense of shared culture from scratch. Um, Gibbard maintained that funding was inadequate to fulfill his vision, which he described as encouraging the English way of life. Many people were unaware of Harlow's wealth of 1950s public art, as we've heard. Um, obviously, this. And I hadn't realized until today that it's actually been in seven or eight different places, not being, a, I have to confess, a regular visitor to Harlow. Um, but many people were unaware, and the, many of the pieces were tucked away. Um, there was an issue, really, in a sense of people living in somewhat fragmented uh, ways and, and increasingly lo losing the sense of uh, an organic social structure that had been built up over generations, albeit in slum conditions. Culture needed to be about more than simply looking at statues. In Peter Lee, uh, as we've again heard, Parsmore was invited to lead the team on landscape design, and he introduced the Apollo Pavilion, his own work, um, and he came in again, as we've heard, uh, after Lebetkin had left, and he put at the center of his design this structure. He saw it as an abstract form that would link the town's communities and provide a space in which they could meet and play. And it has had a mixed history. Interestingly, we saw the photograph earlier of Parthenon standing against the Apollo Pavilion with graffiti around. Um, and it was nearly demolished. But then a few people came together. And I was interested by the comment that everyone now appreciates 50s buildings. 
people now appreciate, I, uh, you suggested, I think, the speaker, that they don't appreciate 70s buildings. I think you're completely wrong about that. I think people do now appreciate 70s buildings. It just needs good architects like 6A and others to work with those buildings and renew them in a way that makes them viable in the 21st century. And if you look at what's happened to the Hayward, which was near Hayward Gallery, someone mentioned Isaac Hayward, that building was almost demolished several times in the late 80s and the early 90s. There were proposals to demolish it. It's been renovated, and it's now an admired building dating from, 19, well, designed in the early 60s, but dating from 1968. Um, so the question, I think, in a way, is when we build wholly new towns, as we're about to try and do, how do we give them a cultural heart? There's obviously the ancient model of the Gothic cathedrals, England and France, in Wells, Lincoln and Chartres. And William Morris argued that these buildings articulated a cultural idea common to all involved in their production and use. They were res the result, as he said, of the harmonious and intelligent cooperation of the whole body of people engaged in producing the work of the workmen. It's perhaps a rather idealized and romantic view, but there are some principles there that I think are worth looking at. The cathedral offers a metaphor for how the cultural and creative processes can be a basis for a community, fulfilling both economic and social needs. Culture as the creative energy, not as an add-on, is as much needed now as the use of towns and city centres changes. So a new generation of artists and architects are thinking about how art can play a part in the community and moving on from the notion of a sculpture or a sculpture through which you can walk and to some degree participate in. And if you, many of you will recognize this as the recently opened Winter Garden in Granby Street in Liverpool, done by Assemble, who I think are speaking this afternoon. So I'm certainly not going to say anything other than one has to admire the way in which they have worked in that street over many years and not simply have gone in and come out. And the result is a, a work of art and a place as rich as anything that one could imagine. I think it's this kind of approach that does point to the way in which the Arts Council is thinking about placemaking as we go further into the 21st century. It's about people in communities, and it's focused on particular needs, but it's also very pragmatic. In the 60s and 70s, the Arts Council invested in a range of regional theatres across the country. That was the way in which the arts were, as it were, taken to the people. But I think now we're not so much looking at monumental buildings, although those can have a place and sometimes they need to be built. But what we want to try and do is to get art and culture flowing through the body of communal life, through partnerships across civic society, in education, health, well-being, through providing creative opportunities for people, through work with older people, and through economic regeneration. And we recognize that this engagement makes, should also make for a stronger arts and cultural sector producing original work in collaboration with and for audiences. So we work with elected mayors, local authorities, occasionally LEPs when they allow us to, universities, further education colleges, schools, the NHS, business, the voluntary sector. The Arts Council has never been very good at working with volunteers, but it perhaps needs to think about how it can, and the community at large. And we maintain a number of funds and programs that are specific to the concept of place, cultural destinations for collaborations between arts, culture, and tourism sectors, the Creative Local Growth Fund to develop creative and cultural enterprise, the Great Places Scheme 
to address social and economic challenges in 16 places across England. Ambition for Excellence, which funds major national moments such as the 1418 Now programme. 80 to 90% of this money is committed outside London. And of course, there is Creative People and Places, the scheme that was, has been developed over the last five years, which currently has 21 projects in England, um, spending about £37 million. And it's a programme that aims to increase, increase cultural opportunity in areas where there has been historically very little cultural activity. It depends, of course, how you define cultural activity. And the point was made earlier that music has been big in Milton Keynes without necessarily having been funded by the Arts Council, the wonderful Arts Council. Things can happen without the Arts Council. I'm pleased to say, <laughs> even though I stand here representing it. Um, the key element of Creative People and Places is that it involves co-curation and indeed leadership by the organizations in the community. It's really interesting to look at, for instance, Appetite in Stoke, which was started on the initiative of the New Victoria Theatre. Now, the New Victoria Theatre, founded originally by Peter, or at least developed by Peter Cheeseman, is regarded as one of those theatres across the UK that is closest to its community. Interestingly, they thought they weren't close enough to be able to run a programme that went beyond what one might think of as a traditional, conventional, rather traditional, conventional outreach programme. So they worked, they went into the community, they worked with, they found a group, some artists, not in that community, but from elsewhere, who were prepared to move to Stoke, and basically initiated a programme which connects with the new Victoria but is actually independent and is really rooted in the community, working with asylum seekers, working with those who are on benefit, and creating festivals and workshops and activities of a kind that have not been seen in Stoke before. We don't want cultural investment to reinforce existing inequalities. Our current spending plans increase funding outside London by another 4.6%, taking it to, I think it's now 55% outside London. And with 75% of the lottery funding also being spent outside London. But successful investment often poses challenges we haven't anticipated. How can we ensure that the increased value of a place is retained for its citizens and brings benefit back to them? Earlier this year, we supported the independent UK Cultural Cities Inquiry with core and key city groups working with the local authorities. The key recommendation was the concept of city compacts, promoting culturally driven, wide engagement across civic society with targets for inclusivity. The report recognises that one of the problems with cultural placemaking is that it in, can increase the value of assets within the city, but that that value isn't returned to the community. It flows out through the developers, through the investors, through the pension funds. It doesn't necessarily remain in the city. Increased property prices can exclude locals, but the compact provides a mechanism that should begin to share benefits across the community. Artists are often priced out of the environments they have helped to build. That's something that we've been looking to address through the Creative Land Trust, an independent entity set up to attract public philanthropic and social investment funds and to provide affordable workspace in London, taking it beyond London in the next phase. And interestingly enough, Sadiq Khan, who is one of the investors through the GLA in the Creative Land Trust, has insisted that we should move outside London as soon as we can. 
as many of you know, we're currently consulting on our next 10-year strategy. One thing that's emerging very strongly is that at a time of social, political, and economic division, people still feel that art and culture is important to shaping relationships within and between communities. They recognize the value of culture, and they seek engagement, and they seek to make it. A place or a nation is ultimately as, su as successful as its civic relationships and the dialogue that is associated with that. Art and culture provide a platform for that dialogue. Embedding them within the day-to-day -day fabric, people can, ha can help people realize their own ambitions and have a stronger emotional, family, and community life. And I just want to end with one slide which shows a project done by East Durham Creates earlier this year where Sally Sodden and Nicola Lynch were working for nine months with a community in Horden, which is a part of Peter Lee. Um, and they worked to develop a number of projects, which I won't say ultimately because it's actually one step culminated in this project where the work that they'd been doing and the ideas that they'd been talking about and the stories about the community that they had been recollecting were brought back to the community and installed for one full day in five bus shelters on this road, Sunderland Road it's called. It runs north from Horden towards Sunderland. And this, of course, is not the only kind of art that the Arts Council exists to support, but it's a very, very important part of our future. Thank you.